Oh, so um, we've got a great lineup today, and we're we're actually kind of international. Um, we've got uh, some performers from um, Switzerland. A couple of people are on video just because they couldn't be here for one reason or other. Uh, with the Swiss people, it was a time difference, among other things. So um, yeah, so uh, beat. We're going to have you on mute unless you are actually performing, and um, uh, and be on speaker view. And I think we're going to start off with Mary Beth Goodall, who's been a regular with this Lost and Down for a lot of times. And this, I believe, is her own writing. She's going to share with us about um, substitute, the dreaded subject of substitute teaching. OK, thank you. Uh, this is two pages long. I know I always like to look at how long someone's sheet of papers is, so now you know. Um, it's called Savoring Gratitude. When I taught middle school this morning, I asked the boys what they were thankful for. No one said anything. Then one boy chimed in, socks. Socks, I asked incredulous. Was he messing with me? Boys will do that to the substitute teacher. Did he mean socks generally or specifically? And although I felt gratitude for thousands, maybe tens of thousands of things in my life, I've never once felt grateful for socks. Yes, he lifted his ankle, simple, ordinary, cottony red socks. He was serious. Look how nice they are, he said. And he was right. They were nice socks. Thank you, I said. Thank you for reminding me of something perfectly ordinary to be grateful for. For. I meant it. He looked at me like he wasn't sure if I meant it because substitute teachers can be unreliable like that. Um, but uh, that is one thing for which we are grateful. And recently I have felt completely over it. I mean, the current state of this presidency, the power grabbing and money grabbing, I was brought up to care for others, to be kind, to be giving. And I'm so tired of being in a world where winner takes all. I fear that I will become inured to craziness of the daily news. But then I pause, I stop my outrage and my despair. I remind myself to be grateful for small things like socks. Just for today, I'm grateful for the air that lifts a hawk's wings and the river that flows down the mountain and that water eventually travels into a reservoir that lands in my kitchen sink in my New York City apartment, and I'm grateful for New York City's delicious water. For my entire adult life, I have practiced a kind of progressive Christianity and a bit of yoga, and that's where I've learned gratitude and kindness. I've heard the truism, the sun doesn't ask for thanks, it simply gives and I want to be like the sun. I have gratitude even though I have an all-encompassing grief for the virus, for the country's lack of leadership, and yes, also I'm um, mourning my own daughters attempting to return to college. We've had a warm and cozy time during quarantine, but they must move on and perhaps move out rather than, pre rather than perceive I'm losing them. I want to perceive that I'm gaining a vicarious thrill from their college memories as they move back. I loved college and so do they. Uh, and as my children grow up and move out, I'm swamped with my own memories. One moment ago, I was walking down Broadway, one of my, um, pushing my daughters in a double stroller with a skateboard attachment for my son. In the next moment, one of my daughters is taking a train to visit her friend in Providence, Rhode Island, and the other is staying up late coding a new app. And the world has grown with their coding and singing and traveling, and all of it is surprising and beautiful. And I want to be grateful for all of it, the surprises and the beauty. Had I met my former self on the street with the children, I would have been impressed, but I wonder as the mother if I would have even noticed. I might have hurried by onto the next event in my fast paced life on a treadmill jumping from one quick paced event to the next. 
And now that I and we have all had to slow down, I find myself mel melancholy and I wonder what's next. You know what's next? Gratitude and savoring, savoring of the ordinary. Stop and pause. Look how far we've come, how far we still have to go. But still, how beautiful New York City is. What with the Hudson and the outdoor dining, it's as if San Gennaro Festival happens every night of the week on the Upper West Side. But mostly, I want to have, call, I want to have gratitude for my college-bound children, for New York City, and for nice socks. And yes, for the boys who wear them, and for all the substitute teachers, for they too are essential. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, now we're going to try a, a kind of duet of sorts. Um, Tegwin and Cynthia are going to try to read together. Well, fingers crossed that this is going to work. Hello? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> Okay, Tegan and I had a run through and the sinking of us both doing a recital together doesn't work. So we're going to do piece by piece. So Tegwin's going to start. Okay. Okay. So anyway. Okay. So Cynthia Davis and I, being fellow Sagittarians, are sisters of a spirit. And separately both chose the same poem to read. So rather than having dueling pistols at dawn. We're going to read the poem together. Cynthia. So at first glance, it's easy to assume with its fame for rugby, boxing, male voice choirs, coal and steel workers, that Wales is predominantly a strong male society. But some of you might know that behind those strong, burly, rugby scrum halves is the foreboding of a driving, indomitable force of a Welsh mother, <laughs> known from now on as MAM, capital M, capital A, capital M. And she is the one that rules the roost. And Tegwin is going to tell you a little bit more. And I know for a fact that that is true, as we shall see in this poem commemorating Jemima Nicholas by Harry Webb. During the last invasion of Britain in 1797, when the French invaded via Fishguard in South Wales, Jemima led a group of women to confront them and even managed to capture a dozen Frenchmen. It's believed that the French thought that the crowd of Welsh women in their red flannel shawls and black hats were a British army, and they quickly left. And here is the poem, the 1797 invasion of Fishguard. The Emperor Napoleon, he sent his ships of war with spreading sails to conquer Wales and land on Fishguard shore. But Jemima, she was waiting with her broomstick in her hand and all the other women too to guard their native land. For the Russians and the Prussians, he didn't give a damn, but he took on more than he bargained for when he tried it out on Mum. Their cloaks were good red flannel. Their hats were black and tall. They looked just like brave soldiers and were braver than them all. The Frenchmen took one look at them and in a panic they did flee. Cried, ooh la la, and then ta-ta, and jumped into the sea. And said to one another, as back to France they fled, we'd have stayed at home if we'd only known we had to take on mum. The Emperor Napoleon, he was a man of note. His hat was sideways on his head, his hand inside the coat. When he heard the news from Fishguard, his sorrow was complete. Oh, Josephine, what does this mean? My army has been beat. 
I will make this proclamation. Though a conqueror I am, you may conquer all creation, but you'll never conquer ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. That was great. That went very smoothly. Uh, now, uh, John Christopher Jones, who again has been a, a, a backbone of these um, Nossle Lounge, is going to do uh, David's story. And that, if you know, is actually a play on words. I think Chris will probably explain how so. David's story was, uh, I believe he's a Welshman. He wrote plays during the 70s and was very popular. This is from his first play, A Restoration of Arnold Middleton. The most incredible thing happened to me today. In school, a man came up to me, a total stranger, and he said, eh, Bancroft. It's not as if my name were Bancroft, is it? Eh, Bancroft. I didn't know how to tell you this, and I should hate for it to get around, but, well, it's about me wife. It seems, Bancroft, that lately she's begun to manufacture money. Periodically, she lowers her panties and from inside produces coins. It seems to have taken over completely the total use and function of her excretory organs. It's mostly silver, the coins, I mean, not the... Can you believe after telling me this incredible tale, all he could say was, the pity is not gold, Bancroft. Just like that rotten bitch to produce second best. <laughs> I might as well be talking to the wall. When I was young, my mother said to me, never drown but in the sea. Rivers, streams, and other dilatory courses are not contingent with the elemental forces which govern you and me, and occasionally perhaps your father. So remember, rather than die in pieces, subside by preference as a whole. But disintegration is inimical to the soul which seeks the opportunities and chances to die in the circumstances of a prince, a savior, or a messiah. And sometimes, even a little higher. I hope in you we are instilling this sense of dignity and rights, not like your father, the likes of whom hope we never see again, who has, I must confess, wet blotting paper for her brain. Please, please, son, don't ever fail me like your father done. When I was young, my mother said to me, Never drown but in the sea. When I was young, when I was young, there were so many things I should have done. Thank you. So next up is me. Now I have been doing puppet shows and I couldn't do it live because the, the high technical quality of the thing wouldn't be able to be done live. So we're going to try this, we're going to try to play a video that I made of one of the puppet shows I did. When my school closed its doors um, because of COVID and we started to teach on Zoom, I started to try some new things out. And one of them was to do puppet shows. And inspired by a webinar that I've been to, um, they suggested that you try to share things that you were joyful about. And um, I started to share stories from my childhood. And some of them involved whales um, going on holiday to Wales. Um, we lived in London and we would get up at the crack of dawn and drive west towards South Wales, towards 
Pembrokeshire, to Duffet, um, to near Fishguard, where my mother grew up. And my brother and I, sitting in the back seats of the car, would play this game where we would want to be the first to see the sea. Oh, there it is, over there. No, that's not the sea. That's just the cloud. Well, of course, we drove on and on and on. And eventually, one of us would see the sea. Oh, there it is. I see it. I get the ice cream. Oh, I want one too. <laughs> You'll both get an ice cream. That's my dad speaking. Well, we couldn't wait to get to the sea. We were going to a place called Dina's Cross and it had beaches there and we couldn't wait to jump into the sea. Now being Wales, the weather was a little bit unpredictable. So as you can see here, I'm jokingly um, carrying an umbrella. Well, um, we would go in this, we would go in the sea whether it was dry or raining because we just thought well we're going to get wet anyway so it doesn't matter if we go in the sea when it's raining and we would put on goggles and masks and go looking for fish and crabs and things in the rock falls at a beach called Puff Wireless. Well on the way to Puff Wireless was my uncle's farm. Oops. Here we go. There he is, his uncle Owen. And there we are. And my uncle would let us play around in his farmyard. But we were sort of baffled because in the middle of the farmyard there was this object that was covered by a tarpaulin. Oh, come on, Don. Let's have a look and find out what's underneath that tarpaulin. Oh, no, John, we can't. What if Uncle Owen comes along? He might want, not want us to see what's under the tarpaulin. Well, what's the matter, boys? What are you going on about? Um, Uncle, we want to find out what's underneath that tarpaulin. Well, why don't you take a look and find out? So we did. We lifted off the tarpaulin and underneath was a boat. Oh, Uncle, Uncle, can we go out on your boat? Well, I don't know. We'll have to ask your dad to see if it was okay. Well, Dad said it was okay. So, we went out on Uncle Owen's boat. We went out beyond the bay, out to the sea. And there, we saw this bird, well these birds, and they were dark black birds, and they would fly, and they would fly and dive deep into the water. And like us, they were fishing. They were fishing for mackerel, just like we were. Well, this is one of my favorite memories from my holidays in Wales. And and one of the things I didn't tell the, the, the children is that Uncle Owen actually had a hunchback and he lived with his sister. He never got married. And I think that my other uncles and my parents kind of disapproved of him. They thought he was kind of odd. But the thing about Owen was that he understood what children liked. Yeah. And if it had probably been told out to my dad, we would never have gone out on the boat. But my, my, uh, my uncle Owen understood what a great adventure it would be to, for us to go out, out to the sea and go fishing. So that's a very, very fond memory I have of my childhood.
vacations in Wales. That was wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, great great uh, high tech, very high tech there. So we're going on to um, Tom Ely. Uh, this is a poem that a lot of people have heard. Um, it's a wonderful poem, and Tom was very excited to be reading it. And now he's wearing a mask. I'm not quite sure why, but go ahead, Tom. Uh, okay, I'm unmuted. Okay, so this actually was a poem that was suggested by our, um, what are you today, Don? You're uh, the, the maitre d', the host, the- Yeah, maitre d', all that, yeah. Maitre d', okay. So this is a poem written by Max Boyce, who actually has an MBE. And um, it's called, When Just the Tide Went Out. Last night as I lay sleeping, when dreams came fast to me, I dreamt I saw Jerusalem beside a tideless sea. And one dream I'll remember as the stars began to fall was Banksy painting Alan Wynn on my neighbor's garage wall. And dreams like that sustain me till these darkest times have passed and chase away the shadows no caring night should cast. But times like this can shine a light as hardship often can to see the best in people and the good there is in man. And I remember Swansea with nobody about. The shops were closed like Sunday, and just the tide went out. And I remember mumbles with the harbor in its keep, and the fishing boats at anchor, the trawl, the waters deep. And I heard the seabirds calling as the gulls all wheeled about. And all the town was sleeping now, and just the tide went out. And when these days are over and memories remain, when children painted rainbows and the sun shone through the rain, and the doctors and the nurses who stretchered all the pain, and I hope the carers never see a time like this again. And I prayed last week for Boris, who knocked on heaven's door and I thought of voting Tory, which I've never done before. And though the sun is shining, I've no immediate plans. So I'll write a book on staying in and ways to wash your hands. And now more days of lockdown, three weeks of staying in. I'm running out of vodka and I've started on the gin. And my neighbors are complaining. I've heard them scream and shout with the sound the bins are making when I take the empties out. And when all this is over and our fragile world survives, and I hope that God is caring now for the ones who gave their lives, and I pray we'll find an answer for my faith is cast in doubt. And God draws back the heavens and all the stars come out. And I'll remember mornings with nobody about when the shops were closed like Sunday and just the tide went out. Thank you, Tom. Um, I don't see the anguins here. Does anybody see Mary? No. Okay, so we're going to go straight on to the next video, which is Catherine Brace. Well, hello, Anna. Catherine Brace, the Denmark. No Nos on Loving is complete without some humour or a comic sketch. No live performance this year, I'm afraid, but I've put together a few Welsh jokes. Hope you like them. Morning how? Just as a word of intro for the first two jokes, in case you don't know, don't ever mess with the Welsh man. So my son came home from school the other day and told me he'd be given a part in the school play. Wonderful, I said. What part is it? My boy said, I play the part of the Welsh husband. I wasn't pleased at all. I said, go back and tell them you want a speaking part. <laughs> Hail, macho American friends I know married women from different parts of the world. 
One married a Greek girl and told her that she was to do the dishes and cleaning. It took a couple of days, but on the third day, he came home to see a clean house. Another of the friends married a Thai girl and gave her the same orders to do all the cleaning and cooking. On the first and second days, he didn't see any results, but by the third day, his house was clean and dinner was on the table. The third friend married a Welsh girl from Rhondda. He ordered her to keep the house clean, dishes washed, and dinner ready for 6 p.m. For the first two days, he didn't see anything. But by the third day, some of the swelling had gone down and he could see a little out of his left eye. My husband asked me the other day if I was having an affair with a man from Go. I said, how can you say such a thing? It was a beautiful summer's day. Two English tourists were driving through Anglesey. They stopped for a coffee, and one of the tourists asked the waitress, Before we order, I wonder if you could pronounce where we are very, very, very slowly. The waitress leaned over and said, Starbucks. in the USA for more than 20 years. <laughs> and people often say to me, you miss Wales? I say, no, I look nothing like her. She's got long blonde hair and wears a sash. I'm originally from Glamorgan and the Glamorgan Heritage Coast is famous for its beautiful sunsets. I went to the beach one evening and stayed up all night trying to figure out where the sun was. Uh, I was in Cardiff last year and somebody actually complimented me on my driving skills. They left a little note on my car. It said, parking fine. <laughs> I went to the doctor recently and I told her, I can't stop singing the green, green grass at home. She said, that sounds like Tom Jones syndrome. Is it common, I asked. It's not unusual, she replied. <laughs> While I was there, I asked the doctor, have you got anything for wind? She gave me a kite. <laughs> Yesterday, I was trying to log onto the Visit by Wales website. I needed a password of eight characters. So I picked Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. A Welsh king walked into a bar in Barry and ordered a beer. The bartender said, sorry, we don't serve food in here. <laughs> and that's it, folks. <laughs> These jokes were too corny. We land now. <laughs> we are going to, to Jamie now. Jamie, you ready for us? Jamie, it's going to cost you a dollar for you to get unmuted. Right. <laughs> Jamie's going to read something he's written. Queen Anne Baxter dramatizes. He will explain. As you may know, I write occasional articles for uh, NINI, the North American Welsh newspaper, and uh, some of them are very serious, but this is not one of them. Every year since 1973, at Easter and Passover time, on television, Queen Anne Baxter, as Nefertiri, falls for Charlton Heston's Moses, but marries Yule Brenner's Pharaoh on the rebound and demands revenge. In Cecil B. DeMille's film, The Ten Commandments, the greatest event in motion picture history, at least up through 1956. Here are three close-ups of Nefertiri you may recognize. Oh, Moses, Moses, why of all men did I fall in love with a prince of fools? He spurned me like a strumpet in the street. I, Nefertiri, queen of Egypt. 
bring back your sword to me, Ramses, stained with his blood. Although Baxter felt miscast because of her delicate heat, excuse me, delicate features, uh, DeMille said no to a putty nose. She enjoyed watching the movie on TV and said, Nefertiri ruled the glamour arena some 3,200 years ago, and it's surprising how much the ladies of that day knew about the art of the stalking man. She was born on May 7th, 1923 in Michigan City, Indiana. Anne Baxter was the daughter of Kenneth Baxter and Catherine Wright, herself a daughter of Welsh American architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. After the family moved to New York, Anne saw Helen Hayes in Mary of Scotland, in 1933 and decided she would become an actress. Three years later, she played her first Broadway role in the comedy scene, but not heard. It lasted only two months. In 1939, Baxter was cast as Dinah Lord, Catherine Hepburn's kid sister in The Philadelphia Story, but was replaced during the pre-Broadway run. Supposedly, Hepburn didn't like Baxter's acting style, which perhaps wasn't theatrical enough. Baxter, after all, had only studied with the Russian actress Maria Ospinskaya, who had worked with Konstantin Stanislavski and the Moscow Art Theater. So Baxter moved west to the movies. The teenager's first film was the 1940 Twenty Mule Team with Wallace Beerley. Her career blossomed quickly. She became popular in World War II pictures as the idealized girl next door, getting, as she said, almost as much male as Betty Grable. In 1946, her role in The Razor's Edge with Tyrone Power won her the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. Then, after appearing with William Holden, Clark Gable, and Gregory Peck, she was cast in the 1950 All About Eve, starring Betty Davis. Baxter got an Oscar nod, but no statue this time as understudy Eve Harrington, nemesis of Broadway idol Margot Channing, played by Davis. Baxter said she based her performance on her understudy from her very first play, who had once bitchily threatened to finish her off. In 1956, her performance in the coveted role of Nefertiri, an Egyptian beautiful companion, in the commandments was panned in variety as close to the old school histrionics. But the New York Times said it was unquestionably apt, uncomplimentary to a lusty and melodramatic romance. Baxter claimed she loved slinking around. Really, this was silent film acting, but with dialogue. She came back to Broadway in 1971 to replace Lauren Bacall as Margot Channing in the musical Applause, based not quite totally on the movie All About Eve. The understudy returned in triumph, singing 35 years ago while hailing a cab on Madison Avenue in December 1985, Ann Baxter collapsed from a stroke and died eight days later on December 12th at the age of 62. She's buried in the Lloyd Jones Cemetery near Taliesin East in Spring Green, Wisconsin, on the estate of her charming grandfather, Frank Lloyd Wright. In 1960, Baxter's star was added to the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In 2005, a line of Nefertiri's was nominated, but unfortunately not a finalist for the 2005 American Film Institute's 100 Greatest Movie Quotes of All Time. Her close-up line? Oh, Moses, Moses, you stubborn, splendid, adorable fool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Fantastic. Um, now we are on to Bob. I think we're going to be audio only with Bob, though. Yes, Bob yes, is. yes. Let, let me unmute her. Um, them, hold on. Yes. Can you hear me yet? Yes, we can. Good. And it's a shame you can't see me. I look spectacular today. <laughs> hello. Well, hello all. Um, we are we are delighted to be here um, and joining you today. I 
I just want to tell you, it's a quick story. Of course, I'll make it longer. Um, my first trip to Wales uh, was a Robert Lydiard tryout with the Thomas family. Uh, I went over to meet everyone in the Thomas and Mason family who were there in Swansea. And I, the one, I'm, I'm laughing at it myself already because you have to picture the setup. That's what's really funny about it. We, uh, they arranged a lovely little uh, sort of tea party. Tea. Yeah, yeah. A, a, an afternoon tea with the uh, Thomas ladies set on a, on a beautiful little uh, sofa to my right, Megan sitting next to me and uh, all of the Thomas sisters. sisters sitting there. I was there six of them. There were five sisters and a cousin. Yeah. Anyway, they were all sit there and they would ask me. But first, first you have to say their names. Okay. Yeah. The names were Blodwin, Blodwin, Kynwin, Kynwin Gwyneth, Gwyneth, Betsy, Betsy, another Kynwin, yes, um, um, Agnes, mm -hmm. and uh, Marjorie. Marjorie was there too. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, <laughs> but they couldn't have been absolutely lovelier. They were just so just spectacular. And exactly as their names sounded, that's exactly what they looked like. And they were grilling him. They were grilling me. Uh, I was I was sweating. I we will were admit that. Newly married. Yes, we were just married, and I, I went over there for the interrogation, is what they called it, and it truly was. And I sat there, very dressed and proper, and sipping my tea as as properly as I could, being so nervous. And I thought, like, what are they going to do? Flunk me? Uh, I mean. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, I had already passed the test and we were married. So they said, uh, well, uh, Bob, uh, what do we do for a living? I said, well, uh, actually I'm a professional actor. And they looked at each other and they went, oh yes, oh lovely. That's lovely. Very yes. lovely. Very oh yes, lo lovely, very lovely. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, do, you make, do you make a living at that? Oh, I said, oh, yes, yes, I do. Oh, lovely, that. Oh, that's Ooh, very, never, lovely. Never, yes, very lovely. Yes, very yes. lovely. Oh, yes, yes. And is it, uh, is, is it uh, on stage acting, like our Megan? And I went, oh, yes, it's, it's stage acting. Oh, that's lovely. Yes, lovely, yes. Never, lovely, yes. Oh, lovely. And I've done, and I've, I've done a film. I've, oh, I've, uh, I've co-starred in uh, three Academy Award winning films oh, so far. Betty, oh, that's oh, lovely, never, isn't it? Betty, Something, lovely, yes. Never. And I've uh, and I've done a television series or two. Oh, oh wow, well, my show. goodness, oh, never. Oh, and uh, I said the one regret, if you want to call it a regret, is that I, I, uh, I was offered um, an, an audition for a show called Oh Calcutta, where you didn't wear any clothes and oh. you and you carried on raucously on the stage. Oh. And and I I did turn it down, however. And they went oh. Wicked, <laughs> wicked, and I went. But I, but I did turn it down. I turned it down, and they went. Oh well, okay then. Yes, <laughs> and so, so that's how it went. And it was, it was quite lovely. And they were indeed, believe me, at the end of it, they were all on my side, and I was very, very relieved. And uh, the ones that, I, the ones that we visited time and again, uh, I, I couldn't wait to see them again every time. They were could not have been sweeter and more accommodating and uh, lovelier themselves. They were just just lovely and and uh, I certainly look forward to seeing them every time. And, and they, they were, were thrilled lovely. to find out that Bob was Welsh too. Yes, yes, they they were very oh they were thrilled to find that out. Believe yes. me. So there. So there we were. Yes. That it is. Then. That it is then. <laughs> so that's my little Welsh story of my first. My first visit over to the homeland that I was I was again Welsh also and there we were. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bob. That was wonderful. Uh, now we're going over to Marco. 
for uh, one of my favorite pieces. Um, Marco, are you, are you ready? This is um, Eli Jenkins' prayer um, from Under Milk Wood by Dylan Thomas. Thank you. Before I start, I want to say this was not supposed to be just me singing. It was going to be Jane Seaman really singing with me kind of backing her up. But she got incredibly busy and she couldn't do it, so you're stuck with me. Um, so I'm just going to give myself pitch and I'll be off. Every morning when I wake, dear Lord, a little prayer I make. Oh, please to keep thy loving eye on all poor creatures born to die. And every evening at sundown, I ask a blessing on the town. For whether we last the night or no, I'm sure is always touch and go. We are not holy, bad or good, who live our lives under milk wood. And thou, I know, wilt be the first to see our best side, not our worst. Oh, let us see another day. Bless us this night, we pray. And to the sun, we all will bow and say goodbye, but just for no. Thank you. You betcha. Martha. Wonderful. Um, now we've got another video. Violet Snow couldn't be here, unfortunately, but she has recorded some poems she's written. Shmai Paub, Violet Snow here. I'm sorry I can't be at the Nosson Lao and my husband's fifth grade teacher died and we're going to his uh, memorial service. So I was asked to record a little performance. So I'm going to read a few short poems. First one is called, I, I don't write poetry anymore actually, but um, these are mostly from years ago. The first one is called Rouge Haiku. I fly my bike down Avenue B under a slice of moon it's September, my bike is in love. We two share love secrets all through Chinatown, past feast parking, drown the clown, balloon water race, then head back uptown, die happy on first, gorging on moon garbage. Next one is an actual haiku, it's called Night. A planet hangs in the west. An airplane crosses Orion's right knee. And these are uh, lines from Ezekiel in the Bible. They're just sort of random, uh, pretty, uh, it's called found in the Bible, Ezekiel. They don't, they're not um, in sequence. They're taken, just cherry picked. Take fire from among the cherubs within the wheelwork. When those stood still, these stood still. I will remove the heart of stone from their bodies and give them a heart of flesh. Therefore, mortal, get yourself gear for exile and go into exile by day before their eyes. Perhaps they will take note, even though they are a rebellious breed. Eat your bread in trembling. There shall no longer be any false vision or soothing divination. Gone is the wall and gone are its daubers. Can one take a peg from it to hang any vessel on? And this last one is called Love Poem. See only green water, having sunk through the floor of the glass-bottomed boat. Quiet ballets, sometimes fatal, can also save souls. The fish are intimate, kiss your limbs. Oh, the delicious silvery lips of fish, 
in the watery, endless cage of love. The green garden waters that woke you from death now demand you grow gills. Okay, that's it. Um, take care. Uh, uh, and hope to see you all soon. Bye. Okay. Uh, next up is Denny Taylor. Um, some of you know that I um, recently co completed a master's in education and I was so excited to discover that one of the books that was most inspiring for me was written by Denny. This uh, now, however, is not, um, this is from a novel that she's written. She's going to read to us now, Denny. Okay. I just thought I'd start by sharing my paternal grandfather and two of my uncles. So this sits in my place. And I, so I'm, I'm never far from coal mining. And I also, to give me luck, brought my miner's lamp, which was my, I think it was my grandfather's first, first lamp. So when my mother got very old, um, she grew up in Ganaru between Blenavon and Brumau. Um, most of the houses were empty. We used to go down and see people, but um, her whole existence disappeared. And so writing Rosie was one of the ways that I helped her maintain her Welsh identity, remember all her memories, etc. And so Rosie started with an, a number of short stories and I eventually put it into a novel. The thing that's, uh, the, 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 the story revolves around um, a scene that played out many times in my mother's childhood and then in my childhood because I used to go up behind my Nana's house and there were mine shafts there. I think they were really for ventilation, but the shafts were still there and they were 19th century shafts. And, and all the kids used to lie around the edge of the shaft, which was very deep. And we would drop stones and we would count and then we'd hear this great plunk as the, as the stone hit the water. And my mother did that as a child and I did that as a child. And it always fascinated me because my mother would say it's a tragedy waiting to happen. And none of us, are, yes, right. So in Rose's Umbrella, which is the book I'm going to read from, the children are playing, one of the prank planks gives way and a child actually goes down the, the mine shaft. And it, for me, it's, it's the tragedy of Welsh miners and what happened to the families. And so she, Rosie Llewellyn is not just a child, she symbolizes something much greater. When this happens, Sarah, who is her younger sister, is three and she suppresses the memory. 50 years later, she's in Boston She's in an elevator, she's a nurse, she, the elevator gets stuck. She remembers the memory. And so she goes back to being a five-year-old, three, she's about four, I suppose, child. There is a second Rosie Llewellyn, a young girl born in Boston of this Welsh family who knows nothing of the first, the first um, Rosie. And so the whole story is about this young woman in, she's about 14, in Boston, who um, finds her aunt who has been so marvelous and, and such a good friend. And they, they live in the same house and her aunt all of a sudden starts talking in a different voice and is clearly distressed. And she ends up in a psychiatric hospital. And so the, the um, younger American Rosie Llewellyn finds she's Welsh. She finds out that she's not the first Rosie Llewellyn. There is another one. And um, through her aunt writing to her from the hospital, she learns the story. And it does have a happy ending. But the story is really the tragedy of, 
of the Welsh diaspora and of miners leaving Wales. So I, I wanted to share some things from, because my mother met, wrote me notes and I was going to try and share them, but they're much too long, uh, the Welsh bits. And so I, I chose, it's just two pages. I hope it's not too long, Don. Um, but I chose the passage because I think it, it, it relates to us right now. In, it's about being on our own page. And none of us are on our own page at the moment. We're not going to be until we get past November. We, none of us know whose page we're on or what's going to happen to us. And that's where Rosie is in, the, in this short piece that um, I'll share if that's okay. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And I have to say there are parts of this book I can't read. It's much too emotional. So I think I can get through this piece. So. This is Rosie. Oh, and you need to know that Margaret is Rosie's teacher. Rosie's thoughts were racing. She was sitting on her bed, surrounded by Sarah's stories and by the email com conversations they had had about her childhood in Wales. She thought about feeding the ducks with her mother and going to the library. She remembered the moment in the library when she had realized that she was no longer on her own page. She was living on the page that belonged to another Rosie who had lived far away many years before she was born. Thinking back, she remembered sitting in the library, waiting for her books. Her thoughts wandered back to school, to Margaret and to Jesse. She wondered now if Jesse had actually conceded because he knew that Sarah had been hospitalized and that it was really Rosie who was off kilter. Thoughts flashed so fast she couldn't catch them. She was in the public gardens with her mother, in the library, at school, flirting with Jessie, falling, holding on to the old umbrella. And holding on to Margaret, holding on to Margaret, grabbing at her academics, grasping for meaning. When Margaret had talked with them about Bactine and the immense boundless masses of forgotten meaning, she'd written it in her notebook. Intuitively, she'd known it was not some abstract idea that actually described, but that it actually described her present situation. Rosie remembered that on the day that Jessie had asked if he was on her page, Margaret had given them each a quote from Bakhtin to put in their backpacks, to read when they went home. Rosie had forgotten about it. She rummaged in her backpack. The quote was on a crumpled piece of paper at the bottom of her bag. She smoothed it out. Margaret had read them and had read them the beginning of the quote in class. There is neither a first nor last word, Rosie read, and then continued reading. Even the past, that is, those born in the dialogue of past centuries can never be stable, finalized, ended once and for all. They will always change, be renewed in the process of subsequent future development of dialogue. She thought about her quest for her own truth, for the moment she felt Bakhtin was on her page. Did Margaret know that when she had given her the quote? Rosie asked herself. Margaret had given the quote to the whole class, and it was just that she knew that at that moment they were all searching for their own truth. She read the last sentence of the quote, nothing is absolutely dead. Rosie whispered, every meaning will have its homecoming festival. Margaret had taught them to read deeply, to try to find connections to their own lives in the complicated quotations she presented to them. Read deeply, she always said. On the day that she had given them the quote from Bakhtin, she said, remember, there is no prize for getting to the end of the quotation, only for getting the meaning of a phrase or a sentence and being able to put into words what it means to you. She looked over at Rosie, how it fits or doesn't fit on your page. Rosie had smiled at Margaret and Margaret, still holding her gaze, had said, try to imagine the ways in which your lives are part of the past as well as the present. See if you can find connections between what Bakhtin is saying 
and your own lives. Even past meanings, Rosie began, read again, more slowly this time. That is, she focused, those born in the dialogue of past centuries. She thought of her Aunt Sarah's stories in the emails about her childhood in Wales. Born in the dialogue of past centuries can never be stable, finalized, ended once and for all. I didn't understand what that team meant before the emails from Aunt Sarah, Rosie thought to herself. Now I get it. She was not sure she could put into words what it meant, but she understood what that team had meant, except for the homecoming festival. That's it. Thank you, Debbie. Go for it. Thank you. All right, all right. So Don reached out to me uh, a while ago asking if I would take part in this, and I think the subject was memory. I was very active in this congregation in the 1990s and into the early 2000s before life took me away to different places. So it's been a long time other than the occasional visit that I've been able to attend uh, the Welsh congregation. But I think just a memory of the way things used to be, and I'm, I'm happy to see so many of the people who were there when I was there. Uh, you know, just looking at the pictures and looking at the names and uh, Teglin, Cynthia, Jamie, Don, Betty, and more. I'm sure I'm missing at least a few on the screen. And one of the things, Cynthia and Teglin just did a bit about the Welsh mom. And I think that that's a really important thing in that the backbone of the congregation back in those days was the Welsh mom. It was these great women who really carried the whole congregations. There were certainly a lot of men who thought they were doing the job, but it was the moms. And uh, I can remember absolutely wonderful box after services, the Nosweithi uh, Alawan with all the food and the St. David's dinner and all of this. And it was really joyous, events where everybody came together and in the nature of the congregation as I'm, I was considering what I was going to say today there was an element of a marriage of different things uh, there were pe people from Wales people from North America people from England there were people who were Welsh speakers by first language people who were English speakers those who were learning the Welsh language or attempting to um, there were people uh, who grew up in the Welsh chapels. There were people of, who were searching. There were people of no faith at all. And yet all of them came together in this place to celebrate a culture and a history that they were attached to in one way or another. Um, and it was a very important part of all of our lives, I think. And it was certainly an important part of mine. And it's something that I still miss to this day. Um, and so, you know, I, can, I won't go on long, but there's something that I came across. This marriage of different elements, this um, joining together of streams of thought, of consciousness, of language, of culture. And I found something that I'm going to read to you, uh, if you don't mind. Now, for those of you who are Welsh speakers, please forgive how rusty I've gotten with lack of use, but I'm gonna, it's a short clip. It'll be in Welsh and it will be in English. And it's a poem called Priodas or The Marriage by Dick Jones. And I think this really speaks to what I'm trying to communicate. Dwi galon in the head, dwi davod on in yaith, dwi raf on kidio and dolen, di enaid on in tithe. And that translates to two hearts, one wish, two tongues, but one language, two ropes that join connected, two souls, but one journey. And I think that's really what I experienced in the Welsh congregation. And though I've been distant and not able to attend frequently, I hope that's the experience that you're all having. So uh, I, think, I think that's it for me and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Paul. It's nice to share those memories. Um, so uh, at this point, we're actually going to have Rodri and Sioned, um appear, but 
we had some technical problems. They recorded the video, but there was been some Google problem. But they had they wanted to say, I'll say it for them. You know, they're in Hong Kong and they wanted to say hello and how much they missed us all. Um, unfortunately, because of technical problems, we weren't able to show it. Um, now, Shruti. So this is a Welsh hymn, uh, well, a hymn that is in Welsh. Um, in English, um, when I survey the wondrous cross and Gymraeg in Welsh, Urth Edric Yesi Ar Groes. Urth Edric Yesi Ar Groes, a methodaf an der dange hinois. Rhyd hi'n rhywyd an difris o'r hyd, a'r hwl o gonyant i hanlwyd gyd. Na ddim am ddyr i ein rhywyd gyd, ond yn dan dau the boy nighty hath war all glory. Guy for the lamb frost he me boy. Boy not love when he thought a choice. Trist you got her heart of her grace. Blame Ifrin with a hyvath of a rhyme, Eri oedd o'r blaen dan fwr ond rhyme, Pam car ai fydd a hyna yn hwyn, Ond yma hwr dref lawer mwy, a dal a gari lavo hui a thrawit ol zeb wedin bi. Thank you, Shruti. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, now some comedy from Kirsten, Mark. Hello, everybody. This is Kirsten Mogg. Um, if you're so inclined, if you wouldn't mind unmuting your phone, so in case you think anything that I say is funny, I'll be able to hear your reaction. That would be nice, but up to you, because um, I guess you'd have to then remute it. Oh, I can do it. Um, yes. If we get some extra noise, then I'll have to mute everybody. So please forgive Perfect. me for that. In, in oh, no. Okay. No, I know it's. I know oh, it's everybody's different. gonna get unmuted. Oh boy! Oh, Here we go. <laughs> exciting! Wow, that's better than asking you to send me an email if you thought something was funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, hello, my name is Kirsten Mogg. Um, I'm glad to be virtually with all of you. I hope all of your friends and family are safe and have not, you know, perished in the COVID times. Of course, I'm not happy that. 200,000 of our fellow citizens have sadly perished during the last six months. Roughly half the deaths of Americans in the four years we were in World War II. Sorry, my sad note <laughs> to begin my comedy act. Uh, so my name is Kirsten Mogg and I don't know if you all know, but I'm um, half Welsh and half German. So I have a megalo maniacal streak going about my potential career in poetry. Uh, so, I, and I wasn't gonna do this, but I'm gonna focus my attention more so on one subject because this person, all he really seems to want is attention. So maybe if he gets enough of our attention, he will go away, I hope. Um, I've, I've heard that he's looking at some other opportunities for 2021 in any case. Um, you know, people say that people in America don't think there is any place else in the world. Uh, I think Trump doesn't think there are any other people in the world. 
besides us. I think, I think what's going on is Trump thinks he is the internet. He may not be aware, he's sort of semi-aware that there is an internet. He has a vague feeling that there's something like it. So since he thinks it exists, as he does, he decided to steal it and say it is his own. So like the internet, Trump thinks he can say anything at any time and that makes it true, just because it is there. Um, and every time, you know, he doesn't know how to work a computer. So every time he turns on the internet, he sees his own tweets. So he figures it's his own personal channel. Um, I think it's, I think it's problematic. I don't like it when people in power who, who don't know how the world works. I mean, do you all remember when the elder Bush went into a grocery store and he, they scanned a can of peas and he had no idea that that's how you buy a can of peas. I mean, Trump has like never been on a computer. I mean, how is he supposed to understand the modern world? And really, you know, like the rest of us, he should be taking his frustration out on his computer, not the rest of us. Um, you know, I'm kind of recently married, seven years now, and I've had this theory about couples and getting your frustrations out. Before I was married, I used to get really mad at this shoemaker who lived, who was, uh, shop was down the street, and who coincidentally was from the same place as Stalin. And um, like a couple of months ago, Stalin's daughter dies. I, so I had this theory about it's good for couples to clash. And I looked uh, Stalin's daughter up on Wikipedia and she said, literally, you know, my dad was kind of okay. Uh, he and my mom fought, but then when my mom had enough of him and she left him, you know, like 20 million Soviets died. So uh, with Trump, I think, I doubt he fights with his wife, wives as a, uh, uh, it might be good for us if he did, but anyway. So um, I, I've been up north mostly, and uh, we have a dog, and recently our dog got skunked. And I, it gave me this feeling like, wow, this is kind of reminiscent of something. It's because having Trump as president uh, with the people that he hangs out with is basically like, like getting your dog skunked. And it, it would be if our dog came home and be like, you know, I really like this skunk. I want to hang out with him all the time. Can I please? <laughs> That's what it's like. And the thing about when your dog gets skunked, it's hard to get the smell out. And then when she goes in the rain or she goes in some other water, you know, the smell comes out again. Like when Trump does these rallies that he does, uh, the skunk smell comes up. And, and another time when the skunk smell comes up with the dog is when she goes out in the rain and it's kind of misty. Um, now when, Trump's, when Trump starts talking about Putin and Erdogan, the skunk smell comes up also. Um, having Trump in the White House is like, um, you turn on the TV expecting to see like a great BBC drama. And instead you get an audio recording of a radio drama of a Christian themed story um, on the radio with two people changing their voices frequently to voice all the characters. Um, it, what I think is interesting is a lot of people in this country, you know, they seem to be okay voting for Trump. I mean, they're voting for this person to be president of the United States, but if he was your newly moved in next door neighbor and he came over and he offered you a plate of brownies, you wouldn't eat them. I mean, it, he would explain it. Um, I, uh, how did, did I make the brownies? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I got out my easy bake oven and oh, the light bulb was burnt out, but that's okay. Betsy DeVos mixed the batter for me. And uh, I think they're gonna be really, really good. I didn't try them. Uh, 
my wife wouldn't try them. And uh, my daughter Ivanka said, no, they're not kosher. Um, I've heard that Trump is really not that self-confident and he's starting to put his feelers out for a new position starting in 2021. January, that is. I, I think I've heard he's closest to either being head of the Mormon church in North Korea or the Scientology church in Russia. Good fit. Um, I'm kind of, you know, quasi newlywed now, seven years. And um, I've noticed my husband doing something a little bit strange lately. I mean, we have a puppy, she's two years old, but this morning, Steve was, you know, in the kitchen and I was working on this comedy stuff. And Steve said, he was like, uh, we're going for a walk, then we're going to do the recycling, then we're going to, you know, go to Lowe's. And I was like, who is the we? And I don't know, but I think he might uh, be looking at Izzy, our, our very cute dog, as uh, sister wife number two. Um, I'm not really sh quite sure why people like Trump. I think the appeal is um, people are like, uh, well, let's let's see. He's stupid, and you know, I, I'm kind of stupid. And and don't get me wrong, I'm part of the stupid train myself. And he has money, and uh, he has an important position. Maybe that could happen to me too. Um, but I don't know. I'm not quite sure what the appeal is. Um, and you know, I don't know, you guys are probably all watching a lot of TV like I am. It's, it's so irritating, the commercials. It's not bad enough that they charge just way too much for our health insurance so that they can pay for, um, our expense, you know, their expensive commercials. But now they're starting to advertise. Um, uh, now they're starting to advertise pet medicine on TV, and I also heard that Trump wants to save money on his campaign. You know, he doesn't want to spend money on ads. So I've heard he's going to uh, consider combining his ads with some pet product commercials. Personally, I don't think the skunk smell removal product was a good idea, but that's the plan. Thank yes, you so fantastic. much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> now, Philip um, is going to share, I believe you're going to share some proverbs. Go. All right, go. good. Uh, thank you. Great. So I'm going to share some words of wisdom with you. I hasten to add they're not mine. They'll come in the form as Don said, of Proverbs, and they're going to be in Welsh. In Welsh, we call them Diar Hebion. So I'll read them in Welsh, give you an English version, and then go back to the Welsh so that you can remember them. So here we go. Adhug voi, adhug voi. He who steals an egg will steal more. Adhug voi, adhug voi. Next one I know very well. Deipar gwaith yw ei ddechrau. Starting the work is two thirds of it. They part gwaith, you weigh the chrai. Christine, I, I'm sure, will like this next one. Do it and thou, I'm the gavite, I'm the elin, do it dim. Speak well of your friend, of your enemy, say nothing. Do it and thou, I'm the gavite, I'm the elin, do it dim. Gwet for muthin vahin na flas aras. Better my own cottage than the palace of another. Gwerth fy mwthyn fy hyn na flas arall. Gwerth swrth dda na sofren ddru. Better a good penny than a dud dollar. Gwerth swrth dda na sofren ddru. Hir yw pob ymaros. I know Don is waiting for me to get, get done. Uh, all waiting is long. Uh, Hir yw pob ymaros. Na ad is davod dorith udv. Let not your tongue cut your throat. Na ad is davod dorith udv. Tavid maban on ni siv egadachan. The child will grow, his clothes will not. 
This one I like. Sigurdod you claw de clair. A sword's honor is its idleness. Sigurdod you claw de clair. Hen a timlir her gudion a guide an evank. This one I know well. The old feel the blows suffered when young. Hen a timlir her gudion a guide an evank. Hebe vai, hebe any. He who has no faults is not born. He by by, he by any. Abo bon, ben, bid bont. If you want to be a leader, be a bridge. Avi ben, bid bont. Deval donk a I like this one. Tapping persistently breaks the stone. Deval donk a dirregareg. Avenog lord, bid varu. The best way to gather praise or recognition is to die. Of an oglod, be it varu. Meister, poor gwaith, you a marver. The achievement of all work is practice. Meister, poor gwaith, you a marver. Niedrich angai, pui decav e dalken. Death considers not the fairest forehead. Ni edrych angai pwy decaf e dalgen. And then finally the one which I think we all know. Hen edl heb iaith, hen edl heb galon. A nation without a language is a nation without a heart. Hen edl heb iaith, hen edl heb galon. Cymru am beth. Back to you, Don. Thank you, Philip. Wonderful. I, I really, I, could you send me those? I'd love to, to have them. Sure, we'll do. Um, now, something very special, um, all the way from Switzerland. I don't know uh, how many of you remember them, but the Schlatter, um, Catherine Schlatter, uh, two musical children and a third musical children, young child, a uh, one-year-old. This is a very, very funny, very special video of them playing uh, a piece by Schubert. Um, this is on video, of course, because, uh, uh, because of the time difference. That's very special. Um, well, we have, uh, um, before our final uh, performance, we have an addition. Um, my wife insisted that she would like to share something. So she's going to share a reading. Isn't there? All right, so I, I just put this together this morning and I didn't have time to write something of my own. Um, and I wanted to recite a monologue and, and I gave up after not being able to find something meaningful. Instead, I'd like to share an excerpt from a sermon I heard on the Jewish holiday about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I'm just, I'm quoting this, this sermon, but I cut it down quite a bit. 
Justice Ginsburg, how fortunate to be able to devote one's life to the pursuit of justice. Her first name was Justice. And the Torah, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish book of law, commands justice, justice, justice thou shall you pursue. The word justice is repeated for emphasis. When Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, many people felt personally bereft as if they had lost a family member. Some people fill such huge spaces in our lives that when we lose them, we can scarcely comprehend. God pours into these people some mysterious talent, some heavenly mixture. The rest of us stand in awe, bask in their reflected radiance. Her death should not have come as a surprise. She was in poor health for many years. And yes, she survived challenge after challenge pulled through so often that we almost forgot that she was mortal. She gave all she could, every last drop of life's energy entirely consumed. She died on the bench. A good life, a life well lived, leaves a void. We feel this void. When a great teacher dies, all are next of kin. Every day it is as if we have lost, it is as if we have lost a family member. We benefit from their teachings, implement their judgments. Justice Ginsburg was a formidable presence in the life of our country. Millions mourn her. It's not just worry about the direction of the country. It's that we felt in some way that she was our family member. She was a daughter of our country who represented the best of us. She wielded enormous influence in a quiet way. Every American girl, every American woman, and every American man or woman who cares about equality and dignity owes her eternal gratitude. She was ferocious in pursuit of justice, a quiet, introverted woman, slight and small, with this gigantic spirit of a warrior. She was a magnificent soul. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was quiet, thoughtful. She ennobled our spirit. She taught us about fairness, dignity, and decency. She taught us to pursue justice relentlessly, never give up, never give up. It has been said, the righteous ones, even in death, are called alive. alive. How can someone who has passed away still live? Because their words, their teachings, their example lives on. Maya Angelou wrote, when great souls die after a period, peace blooms, slowly and irregularly, spaces fill, with soothing electric vibrations. Our senses restored, never to be the same. Whisper to us, they existed, they existed. Well, we did it, folks. Um, we did it. One last performance. Um, we made this happen. It's been strange to be on Zoom, um, but it worked. Um, it's brought us together. It's been, this has been such an important thing for me. Um, we revived the Noston Lauen um, eight years ago and um, it's going strong. And so I just wanted to thank, I really want to thank Denise. She's a person I really, really, really need to thank because without her, this would have been not possible. And we were up early first, first thing this morning trying to work out how on earth this was all gonna to come together particularly the videos. Yeah, and I'm so it was like this this morning. Yeah, we were crazy. <laughs> so we're going to end on a musical note with Megan, and I believe we can see Megan now. Yes. Yes, we my, can. My, I don't know. My camera all of a sudden decided to work. I, honestly, I don't know. Quickly about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, if anybody watched the memorial, um, when Denise Graves sang the American anthem at the end, uh, we were thrilled because um, she sounded beautiful, and the, that particular song is a song by Jean Shear, and I did Cats with Jean Shear in the 80s in Vienna, and um, he's a dear friend of ours, same birthday as my husband, yep. and um, he has now become a, a rather well-known librett opera librettist. Um, we were actors together. <laughs> And he's now an opera librettist, and some of his operas have been done in the Metropolitan Opera. So we were 
quite proud of him in that beautiful memorial that his number his song was uh, was was done. And and like him and a dear friend who played opposite Megan in Vienna, uh, 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 Cats uh, show, uh, we celebrate with him our mutual birthdays, birthdays. the three yeah. of us. But also uh, when Bob was talking about the aunties and the oh, cousins, yeah. my Gwen, um, Agnes made this little Welsh doll crocheted, of course, with crocheted skirts and little pantaloons crocheted too. But we don't look too closely. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there she is up there. So uh, I'm gonna sing um, Always by Irving Berlin, which was our wedding song, which we celebrated 28 years this year. So. Everything went wrong and the whole day long I feel so blue For the longest while I forget to smile Then I found you Now that my blue days have passed Now that I found you at last I'll be loving you always, always with a love that's true always when the things you planned and need a helping hand I will understand always always Days may not be fair always. That's when I'll be there always. Not for just an hour, not for just a day, not for just a year, but always. Not for just an hour, not for just a day, not for just a year, but always. Please unmute everybody to applaud. Everybody unmute. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Don, for Thank everything. You, Don. Thank yes. you, Don. Thank, Thank you, Denise. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. everyone. Thank yes. you, Myra. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Wonderful Thank to you. see everyone.